I normally do this on the hematoma block and use 20 mils of uh, low calcetic mix, which is 1% lidocaine with adrenaline, half percent marcaine with adrenaline, and some sodium bicarb at a one to 10 uh, ratio. I then perform a hematoma block into the fracture itself with about 15 mils of, uh, of my mixed solution in the same syringe. I then do five mils as a ring block around the ulna because there's normally an ulnar column injury associated with it and if you don't block that then they won't like it when you manipulate the fracture. I then want to disimpact the fracture and I've got my assistant here who needs to put counter traction proximal to the elbow. Now you shouldn't put counter traction on the forearm because you want the forearm muscles and tendons to lengthen and obviously their origin is the medial and lateral epicondyles so if you c compress here then you'll be pulling against them. Traction for about two minutes to disimpact the fracture and allow those muscles to lengthen before you do your manipulation manoeuvre. So the best way to do this is to be in a relaxed position with your assistant with her elbows straight and you lean back. Now, sometimes patients have very frail skin, so it's important when you're holding the hand, you can deglove the skin very easily. So you can change the pressure of the hand and you should also put more pressure over the thumb and disimpact radially as you go and gently melt the fracture back out. But essentially, you're putting counter traction on for a good two minutes. And you can normally feel and hear some clicks as that happens. And then you gently melt that out. Once the two minutes is up, you can then keep the traction on with your right hand, step through, and then put my thumbs behind the fracture. I'm going to extend the wrist, if you let go, extend the wrist, extend the fracture, make it deformity worse, get your thumb behind the fracture, and then flex it back on to the end of the radius with a bit of ulnar deviation. And then I can do the final manipulations with my thumbs on the back of the wrist. I then get my assistant to hold wrist flexion and ulnar deviation and hold proximally, which allows me to apply the plaster. I'm not gonna cast in this position. This is the cotton loader position, which leads to CRPS. This is just to hold the reduction whilst I apply the plaster. The final manipulation in plaster will be on the distal radius and not on the wrist itself. So it's very important where your thumb placement is. I've already prepared my plaster and this is the shape that I make. So when I'm cutting it, I cut it at an angle which allows for the cascade of the metacarpal heads. So you shouldn't have one that comes perpendicular, you should account for that. I then cut a notch out for the thenar muscles. I use a four inch or 100 mil plaster uh, which is more than enough to not just sit on the back of the wrist and forearm, but also to come around the sides. When you're manipulating a fracture, you need to have three-dimensional hold. It's a good idea not to put a full cast on, because you can cause com an extra compartment and compartment syndrome. But if you have one that comes at least three quarters of the way around, then that will normally hold your fracture reduction. I always start with my wool anchoring at the wrist, which is the narrowest most point. Okay, and then I'm going to come up through to the hand. You don't really want to come up much past the metacarpal heads with the plaster. The wool should just go over the metacarpal heads to protect the skin. You don't want too much wool over the fracture site itself. And as you come down the forearm, they're overlapping 50% of the time. A little bit extra at the proximal most extent of the plaster where it can dig in. Okay, my assistant at all this time is, a hold, is holding the fracture reduction. Okay, this is 12 sheets. So normally plaster of Paris backslab comes as six sheets. This is 12 sheets, so you've doubled it up. Okay, that bit comes around the thumb and the cascade fits perfectly on the metacarpal heads. I've probably made this a touch short. There we go and that's moulded into place and not touching skin anywhere. And then you can get some K-band or crepe bandage. And some people make this wet, you then have to use plaster to make it seal, or you can use it dry and apply it with tape. You can make a hole for the thumb, and you want it firm but not tight. And you want to apply some tape, bring the wrist up from flexion and then my final reduction is with thumbs over the wrist fracture itself. 
okay, to avoid the cotton loader position. And then as it sets, I stroke my thumbs over the back so that it's flat. And all this time, I'm thinking about the post-operative x-ray and looking on the lateral view, I want to see very little air gap between my plaster and the actual fracture fragment on the back of the radius. Uh, if, there's, if there's an air gap on the check x-ray, you can almost be guaranteed that it will be slip between weeks one and weeks two. Well, there was a good paper from Ireland that showed that quite a lot of them slip between week two and week three. So if you think you've got an unstable fracture, then you should follow them up with weekly x-rays for the first, second and third week. And you hold that till it's set. The wrist is in fair neutral. It's not flexed. And my plaster is moulded at the right place for the fracture. And that's manipulation and casting of a collie's fracture.